Welcome to lecture 28, Eigenvalues and Eigenvector Applications, Applications of Eigenvectors within Physics. We're going to be covering two different applications of eigenvectors and eigenvalues. They're quite important applications, but they're very different problems. The first one is called the Landau-Zener problem. And the person on the top right is Lev Landau. He's a very famous Russian physicist, won the Nobel Prize, I believe. Uh, the lower one is Zener. I think it's Klaus Zener. He's a German physicist, not quite as famous as Landau, although he was a highly accomplished physicist. And the problem that they solved involved the following matrix. So it's just a two by two problem. We have delta t, delta times t. t is time. So time is starting at minus infinity and going to plus infinity. Delta is just a number, and v is also a number. And we're going to look at the evolution of this problem as a function of time as t goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. And so the first thing we want to do is we want to find the eigenvalues. These would be the instantaneous eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian. And they, of course, satisfy the determinant of h minus e times the identity matrix is equal to 0. And that's actually pretty easy to expand. You find it's equal to e squared minus delta t quantity squared minus v squared is equal to zero, so you immediately get e is equal to plus or minus the square root of delta t squared plus v squared. So they're two energies, and they're separated from zero. And if we look at those energies on a plot, they look like this figure shown here on the lower left. And you can see as time goes to minus infinity, the lowest energy state is the zero one state, whereas as time goes to plus infinity, the lowest energy state is the one zero state. So if I always stay in the ground state, I'm going to be making a transition from the 0, 1 state to the 1, 0 state as a function of time. And so that's summarized for you here. Far to the left or for very early times, we're in the one, 0, 1 state. And then at very late times, we're in the 1, 0 state. Okay, so... If we stay in that lowest energy state, the ground state, then we're making this transition from the uh, yeah from the e plus state to the e minus state, from the zero one state to the one zero state, as stated here, and as shown on that picture. And in quantum mechanics, of course, we have this phenomenon called tunneling, so we can actually tunnel from one state to the other. And that's going to reduce the probability that I would stay in the E minus state at the end. And you have to calculate the value for how much tunneling is going to occur. That's called the Landau-Zener problem, actually calculating that tunneling probability. How much will tunnel out of the state and how much stays in the state. And effectively, Zener, Landau got the problem solved correctly, except he missed a factor of pi in the exponent. And Zener found a way of mapping the problem onto a conventional differential equation that was a well-studied equation from mathematical physics, and he was able to immediately extract the answer from that mapping. What we're going to do is we're going to look at it from a quantum mechanical point of view. And so let t denote the time, and then let's look at our wave function as a function of time. It's going to depend on two quantities, an a of t and a b of t, and it's going to be this vector that's shown for you. And as t goes to minus infinity, we know the ground state is going to be in the 1, 0 state. And so we're going to be starting in that state. And then the time-dependent Schrodinger equation tells us that the derivative, i h bar, the derivative of psi with respect to t, is h of t times psi of t. What we're going to do is we're going to discretize that derivative. So we're going to write it as i h bar psi of t plus delta t minus psi of t divided by delta t, where delta t is some fixed constant now. We're not taking the limit delta t goes to zero. That's what it means to discretize. You work with a finite value of delta t rather than taking the limit. And now what we're going to do is we're going to solve for psi of t plus delta t. So that rearranges the equation. We get psi of t plus delta t equals 1 minus i over h bar h of t times delta t times psi of t. Now, 1 minus i over h bar h of t times delta t in the limit where delta t is very small is the same as the exponential of minus i over h bar 
h of t times delta t. So we're going to replace that because our delta t is small with the exponential. And now we're going to do another step. And we're going to do another step. And we're going to do another step. And so what we're going to find is after we've done some number of steps, we will get e to the minus i over h bar h of t delta t times e to the minus i over h bar h of t minus delta t times delta t plus e to the minus i over h bar h of t minus 2 delta t delta times delta t all the way down to minus i over h bar h of t 0 times delta t where t 0 is the time that I started at and then of course I have to multiply that all by psi of t 0. This is a very famous formula in quantum mechanics it's called the Trotter formula and even though it's normally viewed as a rather advanced topic you can see its derivation is actually pretty simple and just using the quantum mechanics that you already know, the fact that there's this time-dependent Schrodinger equation is really all you need to know to be able to derive this Trotter formula. And so that's why we're doing it here in the class for you. Now the probability to stay in the lowest energy state is simply the overlap of the final state, psi of t equals infinity, with the lowest energy state, which was e minus, and then I take the modulus of that and I square it. And that formula is actually a postulate of quantum mechanics. It can't be derived. Now doing this calculation is fairly straightforward once you've chosen your delta t, but it would be extraordinarily tedious to do it by hand, and so it really has to be done by a computer. Now the way in which Zener did the problem was he mapped the Schrodinger equation onto a differential equation that was a well-known differential equation and then from the fact that the solutions of the differential equation were known he could extract what the answer was. That is not something we're going to do now or do that for you because that differential equation is a really unpleasant differential equation to work with and not many people are familiar with it and it doesn't really make a lot of sense for you to learn that. However, the stuff that I did teach you is the stuff that's really important for understanding how quantum mechanical systems evolve as a function of time. And so that's something that is really important to remember as you go forward in your future physics classes. Okay, we're now going to go on to our second problem, which is the oscillations in an ion trap. And believe it or not, you can trap small numbers of ions in a trap in one of the kinds of traps called a linear Paul trap. They're aligned in a line, and they essentially feel a harmonic trap potential and a Coulomb repulsion between each other because each of the ions are charged. And on the upper right here, I have a picture of what these ions look like. If I shine light on them, they kind of act like lighthouses and shine light back onto us. And those are actually pictures of four individual ions and the light that they're emitting as they're being lit up by having a laser shine on them. And then schematically, our picture, the picture below that shows atoms 1, 2, and 3. They're positively charged. They're sitting in a harmonic trap. They'll feel some repulsion, and so they'll be expanded from each other. And the potential energy is just the harmonic trap potential energy plus the Coulomb repulsion between each of the different ions. And those are the two parts of the potential energy that are given for you here. We're working in dimensionless units, and so we don't have an E squared on top of the second half. We just have a 1, and that's because of the units, that, the particular units that we're using. Okay, the kinetic energy is, of course, just m over 2 times the square of the velocities for each of the particles. And here we're working on just doing the velocities in one dimension. And then for equilibrium, what we need is we need the derivative of the potential energy to be zero for each of the different ions. And this then gives three equations. I take a derivative with respect to x1, a derivative with respect to x2, and a derivative with respect to x3. They all look pretty similar. There's a kappa xi term coming from the harmonic potential energy, and then there's this one over xi minus xj squared term coming from the Coulomb repulsion, but if you look closely, the minus signs or plus signs are different. So the first equation has two minus signs, the second one has a plus and a minus sign, and the third has two plus signs. And now if you stare at these equations for a little while, you learn that the equilibrium position x2 equals zero is going to solve this problem, with x1 equal to minus x3, and then if I plug that in, I can actually solve for what all of the coordinates are, and you find it solved by x2 
equals 0, x1 equals minus x3, and x1 is equal to the cube root of 5 over 4, cap, 4 kappa. And so that's the solution for what the positions are, but we're interested in the oscillations about equilibrium. And so now we have to do an expansion of that potential energy in terms of some small deviation about equilibrium. So we're going to call that a delta x1, a delta x2, and a delta x3, and we're going to expand that potential energy in terms of delta x1, delta x2, delta x3, and it's a really long expression. So the harmonic term is not so bad. I get the one-half kappa xi0 squared, then the next order term is kappa xi0 delta xi, and then the next term is one-half kappa delta xi squared, and then that's actually it for the quadratic term. There are no other terms. For the Coulomb terms, I get the 1 over xi0 minus xj0, and then I get some delta. It's either a plus or minus delta x times 1 over xi0 minus x20 quantity squared plus a 1 half. The second derivative has got a delta xi squared minus a 2 delta xi delta xj plus a delta xj squared and a one-half overall in front of it. So it gets pretty complicated as you expand this out, but it's pretty straightforward to do. Now the first set of terms, the terms all the way on the left, are all constants. They're just a number. They're just functions of xi0. So I can ignore those because I can always add a constant to the Hamiltonian. It doesn't change anything. The terms that are proportional to the delta xi's, if I collect them together, like all the delta x1 terms and all the delta x2 terms and all the delta x3 terms, I'll find that the coefficient is exactly the thing that I said equal to zero previously to find the equilibrium position because the derivative of the potential at the equilibrium position is equal to zero. And so those guys are all zero as well. And so all I'm left with are all the terms that have the one half and uh, have either a delta xi squared or a delta xi delta xj multiplying them. That's all that's left after all the dust settles here. Okay, so we can then write this as this constant plus a quadratic form. We're going to have a one half. We're going to have the vector delta x1, delta x2, delta x3 multiplying this matrix that is being formed for you here. It's a three by three matrix. And then we're going to multiply by a column vector on the right hand side that's going to be the delta x1 delta x2 delta x3 term again now as you can see all the diagonal terms they have this kappa term and then they have some terms that are proportional to the potential energies and then the off diagonal terms are the terms that involve the delta xi delta xj terms and so this three by three object is of course a matrix and what we really want to do is we want to find out what are the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this matrix. Those are what are the so-called normal modes of the oscillations in an ion trap. And to show you exactly why and how this comes about, what we're going to do is we're going to take the equation of motion, which is going to be m times the second derivative with respect to time of delta x, that's going to equal minus kappa effective delta x, kappa effective being this matrix that's in front of you. And what we do is we're going to let delta xj equal e to the i omega t times delta xj zero, where it's the same frequency omega for each j. So all the different ions are oscillating at the same rate. And then when you plug that in, you can do the derivative with respect to time. You get a minus omega squared, so you then get m omega squared delta xj zero equals kappa effective delta xj zero. Well, delta xj zero here is a, it's not the initial equilibrium position. It's a delta x zero. This object, it's a number, but it's actually a vector because there's a j equals one, two, and three. And it turns out this is an eigenvalue problem. You see it's saying kappa effective, which is a matrix, multiplying this vector delta x zero is giving me a number m omega squared times delta x zero and that's exactly an eigenvalue problem and so what we have to do is we have to find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors and then to get the frequency we have to take whatever that eigenvalue is divide it by m and take the square root and that actually gives me the frequency of the oscillation and you're going to actually be solving this problem for precisely this three by three 
matrix or for this three ion case on the homework. And so this is a problem that you're going to be working on uh, over the next week or two. All right, that's all that we have today for these two different applications of eigenvalues and eigenvectors within physics. One was to the time evolution of quantum mechanics that involved two by two matrices. And then we had one that involved this dynamics of motion of the ions, which had the three by three matrix that we had to work with.